All right. Oh, I can hear myself. That's wonderful. <laughs> I will move this chair here to block myself from the feedback. Uh, so, hi, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm Geek Sam on Twitter. And uh, I work for Living Social. I am contractually obligated to inform you that we are, in fact, hiring. <laughs> I shall say no more of it. Um, just to set the framing for this talk a little bit, I gave a talk in February about uh, remote pair programming that turned out to be mostly around the people side of things. Uh, if you're interested in that, the talk is on uh, YouTube, and you can find it from a link I'll give you later. Um, this talk, in keeping with the uh, chemistry or cooking track, whichever one this is, uh, is much more focused on the tools that I use. Um, but if you're interested in the other aspects of it and how you can uh, be happier in a pair, um, the other talk might also be of interest to you. Uh, so just a quick story about how I got into the position where I feel actually comfortable talking about remote pairing to other people. Uh, at my last job, we did a lot of uh, pair programming, but it was all in one office here in downtown Portland. Uh, when I started at Living Social, uh, I joined a team that was almost all in DC. Uh, there was one other person here in Portland, uh, but actually, but when I say Portland, I really mean really freaking far away. Um, <laughs> so, as I said, <laughs> the, rest of my, the rest of my first team was in DC. Um, and the problem that I discovered when I went into the office uh, after I got back from DC for, for orientation was that the Portland office had a lot of crosstalk from other, other developers who were working on different projects. Um, I found it very distracting. And when my coworker in Forest Grove uh, tried to work from his house and with me in the office, what he said was actually that the noise was worse because the microphone that I was using couldn't distinguish between my talking and the background noise, and so it all sounded equally loud to him. So I took a monitor and keyboard home with me. Um, my friend configured his firewall so that I could actually get to his machine. And uh, like it or not, I learned Tmux and uh, learned how to use Vim again. Uh, a few months later, uh, we wanted uh, he, the, my friend John and I, who had mostly been working together at, up until this point, we wanted to be able to learn from some of the other brilliant people that we work with, and we wanted them to work together with each other. So uh, we started packaging up some tools to make it easier for people, wherever they were, to pair with whoever they needed to pair with. Um, we published those tools. Uh, they're online. Uh, you can copy this link down quickly or you can copy the one down at the end that will tell you this and a bunch of other stuff besides. Um, also at the end of last year, um, almost around Christmas time, somebody realized that we had a pile of iPads lying around and wouldn't it be a great idea if we could uh, give those to the developers and uh, use those for remote pairing as well. And that turns out to work surprisingly well. Um, and I will talk about uh, why we chose the setup that we chose, uh, but there are a whole bunch of tools that are out there. Um, and I'm going to do a quick survey of what they are and why you might want to use them and give you some uh, ways to evaluate new tools to see whether or not they'll fit the way that you want to work. Also, even though I'm labeling a lot of these things as remote pair programming tools, uh, another surprising discovery that I've made in the last year or so is that they work really well for when you're sitting next to somebody. Um, is Kurt here in the room? No? Okay. Uh, Kurt Sussman, one of the uh, other speakers and who, who's also volunteering here, uh, and I were able to meet up and do some pair programming sitting across from each other at, at Palio in Lads Edition. And it's really nice, actually, to be able to sit there and look down and see your code and realize that the other person has the same code on the screen in front of them. And just when you need to make eye contact and have a conversation, just look up. Um, so I think it's worth learning how to use some of these remote pairing tools, even if you're not going to be doing a lot of strictly remote pairing. So. These are things that tools should be able to do for you. Um, all of the participants in a pair programming session need to be able to hear each other. Uh, that's kind of bottom line. Uh, they preferably should be able to see each other. Uh, I was pretty strict about, or I guess uh, fundamentalist, about um, not really needing video because I thought it was an, an extra. But when we got those iPads, 
uh, I was actually really amazed at what a difference it made, even when I was working with somebody who I had already been pairing for two and a half years with. Um, oh, side note. Uh, I've actually never met any deaf programmers. I've only ever met one blind programmer. Um, if you are trying to accommodate those particular disabilities, uh, First off, I'd love to hear about it, because that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but you probably have different priorities for voice and or video on these. Um, anybody here had to solve those problems? No? no okay. Not quite, although um, people who learn English is not their first language. OK. So when there's a, whether there's a language barrier or a, a translation overhead. Interesting. OK. How do you uh, how do you solve that? Do you just go slower? Or? Um, in my opinion, it's important. It's super important to have some kind of chat channel that's really easy to access. Where you oh can yeah. Type oh yeah, that makes sense. So having a some sort of a group accessible chat channel uh, for a transcript or and clarification. The audio, it has to be super clear. <laughs> yes, good audio is essential. Um, thank you. Uh, in addition to seeing and hearing each other, all participants need to be able to view the code that you're talking about. Um, they, may be, they may need to view other applications, depending on what you're doing. If you're writing a library, it uh, doesn't really matter. If you're working on a web app or uh, something with a GUI, you probably care about poking the buttons once in a while. Uh, ideally, you, all participants should also be able to edit the code in the shared se uh, session, although this is technically optional depending on how you like to structure your pairing sessions. Um, and even better, they should be able to edit comfortably. Um, this uh, it comes up for me often when I'm working with somebody else's uh, Vim configuration and I'm like, wait, what's your leader? I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> or you don't have the plugin that I depend on and I don't even realize that it's not built in at this point. Um, so having some sort of a, a shared standard environment comes in very handy as well. Uh, other considerations to keep in mind when you're looking at tools. Uh, how much bandwidth do you have to burn? How much latency can you tolerate? Uh, on the latency issue, um, I'm actually kind of a curmudgeonly sort, and I've, I've been avoiding IDEs like Eclipse for 10 years or so, because the last time I tried using Eclipse, uh, it was so slow on my you know, then $1,500 machine that there was a perceptible lag between when I would type characters and when they would show up on the screen. And this was just on my local box, and it was infuriating, and I was like, oh, can't do this. <laughs> so I will actually reject a tool if it's too slow. Uh, your mileage and tolerances may vary, but it's something to keep in mind. Also an important thing to keep in mind is how many people are in your pairing session. And I, I know I say pair, and that implies two in English, but um, for the last month or two, I have regularly been pairing with three and sometimes four people in the same session. Um, and some tools just don't do that. So that's something to, to pay attention to. Um, also, uh, this is sort of related to the comfort and uh, standard accessible environment uh, before. But there's also the question of physically, like, where is the code? Uh, where is the running processes that you're working that you're working with. Um, this comes up later when we're talking about some of the cloud-based solutions. Uh, and <laughs> some of those will get you in trouble with your security team if you have one. Um, another thing another question is how easy is it if you're hosting one or the other, how easy is it to switch back and forth? Uh, this again depends on how you like to structure your pairing sessions, but um, I like a lot of back and forth, like I'll stop typing mid-word and let somebody else finish what they're doing. Um, assuming I remember that I need to stop typing, I tend to grab the keyboard. Question. Just, just to make sure, driver is the person who is doing the main typing? Yes. Um, yeah, so the driver, you know, the, the, a lot of the uh, pair programming literature talks about the driver who's sitting there actually physically using the keyboard, writing the code. Uh, figuring out the syntax and doing the, the sort of micro immediate thing, whereas the, the navigator is supposed to be thinking about the next test to write and so on. Uh, in, in practice, I don't use those roles uh, very much or for more than two or, two or three minutes at a stretch, but um, how easily you can pass keyboard control back and forth is, is fairly important. 
And I covered this earlier, how comfortable is the environment for all participants. Uh, it, doesn't make, it doesn't do you much good for people to be able to type if they're not willing to. Um, here are a bunch of tools that uh, I know of for doing voice back and forth uh, with a couple of notes about things like Skype. Uh, they advertise that they will support up to 25 people in a voice channel, which is interesting. Um, the two things that are amusing here are that uh, Hangout, uh, which is sold as a sort of video conferencing solution, works just fine if everybody turns their cameras off. Um, and I just wanted an excuse to put the phrase pants computer on a, on a slide. So that's the other one. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I've been in Google Hangouts with uh, probably eight or ten people, and it mostly works pretty well. Uh, it tends to turn my fans on a little bit because it generates a fair bit of heat. Um, but yeah, it does, it does work reasonably well. But if you're bandwidth constrained um, and you don't necessarily care about video, you, that's not something that you want to spend some, some bandwidth on, you can turn it off. Um, the other thing that's nice about Google Hangout is that it is very, very tolerant of people coming in and out. Um, Skype, sometimes when, the, when somebody ha clicks hang up, everybody gets dropped, and that can suck. Options for video, again, Skype. I used to use iChat. Uh, it pretty much uh, has fallen off the radar. Um, and again, Hangout. Uh, FaceTime is nice if you can use it uh, if the, you know, everybody has the right equipment and you're not dealing with more than one other person. Another question here. Uh, have, I was wondering whether anyone here has tried Big Blue Button. Has anyone tried Big Blue Button? I've never even heard of it. Anyone? Big Blue Button? Big Blue Like IBM Button or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm looking forward to Mozilla WebRTC. Oh, okay. I have not heard that, of that either. All right. Um, cool. Um, so for viewing and editing code, um, there are a lot of tools you can use. I've grouped them into three basic categories, uh, cloud-based sorcery, uh, tools that do screen sharing where they uh, scrape some portion of your desktop area and send that bitmap across the wire, and uh, terminal sharing. Uh, which basically means SSH and Tmux, uh, or screen, I suppose, if you're really old school. Um, some of the cloud-based uh, options are things like Cloud9, MadEye, and so on. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, your legal and or security teams will hate them, uh, especially because um, some of these will leave bits of your code on shared servers, and they tend, at least at Living Social, they tend to frown on that sort of thing. Um, this is a, I'm sort of hand waving over these because while I think that these are going to be really cool in a couple of years, right now um, I kind of want to get work done and I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, adapting to the new thing that came out this month. Um, but I'm glad that people are working on them and uh, I, I look forward to uh, catching up in a year or two. Uh, yes? Etherpad? Etherpad. I did not put Etherpad up here. Um, or yeah, like the Etherpad software, and you could install an Etherpad mm -hmm. on your corporate server. Hmm. Right. Well, Etherpad Lite actually yeah. is a Node.js project. Etherpad yeah. Lite is a Node.js project, right. Oh, OK, cool. That uh, seems like something where you could just install one on your corporate server. That's really an interesting idea. Uh, do you? Yeah. You could probably, you could make a syntax plugin by this time next year if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, right, and will it support all of my snippets? And like, I'm, I'm, I'm a TextMate sure. guy. Um, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly for the Portland Ruby group, um, people have tended to open an Etherpad document and share notes in there, which is really nice. Um, so. Mm -hmm. That's true. Also, yes. Yeah. Um, a coworker of mine was playing with Flubits the other day, and apparently, I have not looked into this, but apparently it may support multiple editors, which is 
another of the problems that I have with some of these category of tools like CoVim sounds really neat, but it basically lets my Vim instance talk to your Vim instance and share the same state, but you still both have to know Vim. So if I want to pair with somebody who's using Emacs or TextMate or something else, then you know everybody has to somebody has to be out of their element. Um, and it, sometimes that's what it takes. But uh, if I can avoid that paying that cost, I get that much more brains available to talk about the code, which is often problematic too. So um, screen sharing. Not much to say about these. They pretty much all do the same thing. They uh, grab a portion of your screen, send the bitmap over the wire, which is sort of inherently slow. Um, and as mentioned earlier, this tends to introduce some lag between when I hit the keys and when I see the effects of hitting those keys, which means that if, if I'm sufficiently fast at my typing, I can get further and further ahead and then make some tragic error <laughs> and then train wreck. Google Hangout does have screen sharing. It doesn't have shared editing, as far as I know. So all the mouse shared editing? Uh, screen Hero gives you, actually, multiple mouse cursors, which is kind of fun. Um, and yes, I, well, Skype may not give you uh, remote control either, but I think the rest of them do. Ah, thanks, so yeah. Um, also, uh, Join Me is particularly good. Uh, Join Me is one of the products available from uh, LogMeIn. Uh, and it's particularly good at getting around firewalls which I like a lot. <laughs> um, last category is terminal sharing tools. Um, the thing I like about these is that they, they tend to consume very little bandwidth, and so they respond very quickly. Um, and for me, I value responsiveness highly enough that I'm willing to go back and learn a 40-year-old you know, editor <laughs> um, in order to use them. <laughs> I saw that, Ken. <laughs> So there are two variants of, of this setup. One that I use is uh, I have my development machine you know, environment set up on my laptop, and I tell other people, come to my machine, we'll share the session on my machine. And so when we run the tests, it's my lap that gets burned. Um, another variant of this is uh, everybody connects to something somewhere out there in the cloud. So. That's sort of a really fast overview of like the kinds of things that are out there. Um, as for what I usually use, uh, it depends. Um, if I'm pairing with somebody for an hour or two, um, I will just use whatever we can agree on. <laughs> you know, if you know, they'll list their set of tools and I'll list my set of tools, and when we find the first thing that intersects, I'm like, go, do that. Um, for some of the work that I've been doing uh, in my day job, uh, we find that with people in different time zones, there's different meetings and lunch times, and so if there are <laughs> A couple of us who all want to get a peek at some area of the code that we're not familiar with, uh, and some people are going to drop in and out, um, then I will use Hangout preferably because, as mentioned, it's really good at letting people come in and out as, as needed. Um, and I will set up LS pair, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, if I have the luxury of the same pair partner for a couple of days, weeks, or months, um, and then I will tell them, hey, you need to get an iPad <laughs> if you don't already have one. Um, tell them how to talk to uh, the IT department to get theirs, uh, and then uh, set up FaceTime and uh, use LS Pair. Um, LS Pair is basically a wrapper around uh, Wemux, which is itself a wrapper around Tmux. Um, as I mentioned before, it's the most responsive option, and I actually boost that a little bit by uh, tweaking my router. Oops, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, I completely skipped that whole slide. Nice. Sorry about that. And now I'm totally lost. This one. This is the one. This, one. this is the, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, it was visible. Sorry about that. Got lost. Tripped over myself. Um, so uh, I did set up my router to prioritize SSH traffic so that uh, I could be assured, assured that even when somebody else is watching Netflix, I can still pair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I use FaceTime uh, partly because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, question. QoS, QoS is uh, quality of service, uh, basically traffic shaping. So my Wi-Fi router will actually prioritize traffic on a particular port. Um, which is nice for shaping latency. Um, 
So I'll use the uh, shared terminal environment for coding, um, FaceTime on my iPad to talk to my pair partner, and uh, as needed, uh, when we need to go and poke things in a web browser, I'll use Screen Hero for that, or uh, sometimes Join Me, uh, whichever one I happen to think of. <laughs> um, one thing about Screen Hero is that you have to friend people first. It's kind of like I am and screen sharing. So uh, if you want to share one session with somebody that you like hooked up with on Twitter and you want to do a pair programming session for two hours on something and you're probably not going to talk to them again for a while, um, it's nice to have join me where you can basically copy an URL, give them that URL, and then when you're done, you just throw it away. Um, which, now that I say that aloud, sounds kind of antisocial. <laughs> Um, okay, so LS pair. This is a uh, set of tools that I hacked together until they were just good enough to support my day-to-day -day work and then pretty much ignored. Um, <clears throat> uh, this contains a standard config file for tmux, uh, which has all of the key bindings that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. It has a bunch of useful things like easy uh, bindings for doing split screens and so on. Uh, it has a standard vim environment um, which was carefully uh, put together by a couple of the experienced Vimmers on our team um, to be uh, useful and not horribly intrusive. <laughs> um, it has uh, an install script to set these things up. Um, it also has a couple of scripts for setting up users. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that Tmux is the thing that actually physically hooks, uh, physically in air quotes, uh, hooks your terminal sessions together and gets them to talk to each other. Uh, but Wemux lets you share a Tmux, easily share a Tmux session between multiple users on the same machine. So I don't have to give people, uh, uh, I don't have to take their SSH key and put it under my account so that they can SSH to my machine and log in as me anytime they want to. Um, I can create a throwaway account on my machine, have them SSH to that so that you know, they're, they have something to connect to and then they just type Wemux and they're good to go. Um, the internal version that we use has a bunch of SSH keys to facilitate that because if there are people who've already said they want to pair, um, we don't have to bother exchanging keys ever again. <clears throat> and uh, I probably put as much work into the README uh, for this repo as all of the other tools that were in it because there's a lot of advice in there and some sort of pre-flight checklists. Um, let me switch over to those real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, so there's like, if you've never used Tmux, here's the bare minimum you need. Uh, and then coming down here, we have uh, how to join a session on somebody else's computer. And here are the prerequisites. Here's the step-by-step -step of the stuff that you need to do. Um, and then scrolling down further, there's you know me going on about audio quality and microphones and so on. And all right. Um, in that spirit, um, I am always surprised at how much time it takes to get set up with a new pair partner. Um, and if something goes wrong, it can eat half of the time that we have available. And so here is, uh, again, a bunch of stuff that I've wasted time on. And I'm hoping that you can learn from my mistakes and uh, save some of that time for yourselves. Uh, firewalls, <laughs> firewalls suck. Um, this is like my least favorite part of getting set up with a new, a new pair partner is like I'm trying to SSH to your machine and I can't even ping it. Um, we have 100 developers at Living Social and we already have a VPN for them to be on. And uh, you know I have the little password generator in my keychain. Um, so that's already there. And since we have that, I, um, I asked uh, if we could set it up to forward traffic on port 22 so that People can SSH to each other if they're already on the VPN. Um, there's also a really good uh, product from LogMeIn called Hamachi, which lets you set up small VPNs that can talk directly, so your machines can talk directly to one another. Uh, you can use it for free as long as your uh, individual networks are fairly small, which is nice. Um, you want your pair partners to be able to understand what you're saying. At least I hope you want that. <laughs> and if you don't, I don't want to pair with you. <laughs> 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 
Um, if you're in a quiet room, your uh, built-in microphone is not bad. I mean, it's a really impressive piece of engineering for the constraints that it that uh, that they're under. But um, even in a quiet room, uh, an external mic that's closer to your face or uh, just generally higher quality almost always will sound better. Um, and I have earbuds. I have a couple of different headsets. I actually have a $60 microphone that I have on a boom. Um, and I've used, I've switched it back and forth between all of them. But you don't have to get crazy. You can get a reasonable um, headset mic for 20 bucks. Yeah? Ever heard of open laptop mic not making loud sounds with keyboard use? Oh, I hate the loud clicky clacky sounds from the I built ins. Never heard of laptop mic ever not yeah. Yeah, and in fact, when I got the uh, the podcasting mic, it built uh, the reason that I got the boom stand for it was because it was set there on my desk, and my keyboard was right there in its pickup pattern. Okay. Um, one exception to the previous slide, uh, which had, you know basically is basic, is about getting a real uh, external microphone um, on the iPad. When you're using FaceTime, it sounds pretty good. Uh, it, you can be heard and uh, understand the, your, the person on the other end. Oddly, uh, Skype and Hangout also on the iPad with the same hardware sound terrible. Um, I think that FaceTime must be uh, tweaking the gain somehow, uh, possibly even adaptively. Um, so if you have it, use it. Um, last uh, bit of advice about mics is uh, please don't breathe into it. Nobody needs to hear that. <laughs> Um, if you want to hear what your pair partners will hear and you have a Mac, there's an app called Line-In. Um, if you have a better microphone, you can actually plug your headphones directly into it and it will uh, let you monitor your own audio and they will also handle the uh, software audio so that you can hear both yourself and your pair partner, which is pretty nice. Um, one caveat about Google Hangouts. Uh, it will automatically mute you if it thinks that you are typing. I don't know why. <laughs> um, which is like what you do when you pair programming, right? You talk and you type, and sometimes you even talk while you're typing, and yeah, uh, terrible. Um, if at all possible, I like to run my video on separate hardware. This is one of the reasons that I use an iPad. Uh, it doesn't steal CPU from your work. I've had somebody who was talking and then just started getting all choppy, and we were asking him, hey, what's going on? What's going on? What are you saying? He's like, oh, sorry, I tried to run the test suite. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hangout will easily eat uh, half of one of my CPUs. Um, it also will eat uh, valuable real estate on my desktop. Um, and so video uh, on my development machine is likely to be moved around. Uh, covered up by other things. Um, and when I move it around, one thing that happens is that uh, it goes somewhere else relative to the camera. So to the person on the other end, it looks like I'm looking over here when I think I'm looking directly at them. It sort of messes with your uh, built-in perceptions. Um, and if you keep the in incoming video, this is one of the things that I discovered with the iPads, is if you keep it in the same place, um, if you keep it always visible, um, and if you keep the video close to the camera, then it helps uh, create this illusion that it's not hardware anymore. It's just a little window that lets you talk to somebody else who's a couple thousand miles away. And that's really cool. Um, uh, it becomes a telepresence device, uh, which is really about supporting primate bandwidth. Um, technically, an experienced pair can do everything they need to do with a shared terminal session and maybe an occasional instant message, uh, but that sucks. Um, and uh, one of the best things about pair programming for me is that when you get stuck, and you will get stuck, you can step away from the computer and you can talk things out. Um, and every step up on this table, uh, I think, gives you an, an order of magnitude more human bandwidth to communicate with. Um, and uh, there's more about that, that aspect of pair programming in the other remote pairing talk that I mentioned earlier, uh, which leads to resources. Um, I have exactly one link for you because everything else that I might recommend somebody li uh, listen to or watch about remote pair programming is here. Um, you can also find some people 
uh, to practice your remote pairing skills with or get into some open source uh, project with uh, on Twitter using pair with me. And at this point, we have about 14 minutes left, it looks like, according to my clock. And uh, you guys get a choice. We can stop, do some Q&A. We can get into some uh, cross conversations, um, which I think would be really fun, especially if some of you have experiences with remote pairing. Um, or if you just came here for the train wreck, we can go to that. <laughs> so could you describe the train wreck? The train wreck. Um, the train wreck is, uh, as mentioned, I've had uh, regularly had uh, two, three, four people in a pairing session. And at one point at a, at a Portland Ruby beginners meetup, I was showing off my pair programming setup. And I had seven or eight people uh, all in the same terminal session in my, in my laptop. And I started thinking, I wonder how many people I can do this with. <laughs> so if you would like to participate, I've actually set up an EC2 node. Um, that you can all SSH to, and we can see how many of us it takes to crash either the EC2 node, <laughs> or I, what I think is going to happen is we'll crash the Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll try this. Um, if if I go down in flames, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Please try to pour, you know, douse me with water at some point. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's attack Tmux. So uh, one thing I will say before I have you all uh, get uh, join me here, uh, Tmux is a really interesting tool. Um, I put together about a 10-minute screencast that if you've never used it at all and have no idea what it's for, uh, this should get you at least a conceptual framework to get started with. Uh, that is also linked on the Pair Program With Me site. Um, the thing that you need to know about this today is that Tmux limits uh, the terminal size to the lowest common denominator of every terminal that's attached to it. So, <laughs> oh, thank you, Ian. I see you're on your, your iPad. So this will be exciting. Oh, it's fine. I mean, the thing is, like, it's not like we're going to be doing anything. Um, I just want to tell you, like, my usual practice when I have people join me is I tell them, okay, make the boom window as big as you can, make the font size as small as you can stand it, now join me, because otherwise, you know, otherwise I get this little postage stamp on my 27-inch monitor. So, uh, please embiggen your terminal windows. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I, oh, shoot. Okay, the trick, is, the trick is not to care. The trick is not to care. <laughs> I will channel my inner Marcus. <clears throat> okay, so as mentioned, uh, and begin your terminal. Uh, here is a URL you can go to, uh, timestream.net slash osbridge dash pair. Um, at least until I get back to somewhere else and take it down, there is a script there, foo.sh. Uh, it's pair.sh? Uh, it's foo. Here, I'll show you. So that pair.sh file, um, you can save to your uh, to a directory somewhere. You'll have to make it executable and then run it. Uh, you can inspect it as well, of course. What it does is <laughs> <laughs> first it installs a rootkit, and then it's basically going to download the private key, which I will also throw away at the end of this session. Uh, it's going to put the private key on your machine. <laughs> SSH to an EC2 node with a really long name I didn't want to put up on a slide. Um, and then when you're done, it'll delete the private key just because that's slightly more polite. And once you have logged in, and once I've run Wemux as well, the private key that that script gives you should mean that you don't need a password. Bugger! <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for a passphrase on the key, really? Yeah. yeah. Try nothing. I didn't put one on it. Oh. What's your bank password? <laughs> Let me ask my password manager. <laughs> uh, well, um, that's disappointing. Um, let me see if we can do this another way. Uh, 
I didn't put a, a passphrase on the key, though. So that's <laughs> exciting. <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so they're 30 characters long and randomly generated. Let me read them to you. <laughs> um, anybody getting this to work? I don't know. Okay, well. Well, the script, the script is supposed to do this for us. Um, here, let me. Oh, because I'm an idiot and I changed the URL. Thank you, Brian. All right. All right, watch this, or rather don't. Try now. Rerun the rerun foo.sh oh, rerun okay. because I've just copied hey, I copied the key into the right place this time. Okay. Okay, I see at least one person has joined me because I see a uh, pair person in here. Yes, once you're in, you should run Weebox. Let me put the slide back up. <laughs> I can't actually watch this and have this. Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, so you'll actually. <laughs> All right. Here, I'll put this. Up, I'll put this up on the screen. So somebody drag your window around and make this smaller, and we'll like we can actually see it. You have to drag it so that it's smaller than the, the currently smallest window. OK, OK. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> wow. We might have to go back to using Edlin at this point, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Drop all tables. Thank you, Bobby Tables. I did not realize you were in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> I'm throwing away this node when we're done. <laughs> so, quick show of hands, who's in right now? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, at least 13. Wow, oh, okay, that's fun. 17, yeah. Oh, nice. Sweet. <laughs> so, it's party programming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I've, so, how have I been doing sessions with three or four? Yes. Well, so the technical aspects are pretty straightforward. Um, you, everybody connects to Tmux and everybody can type all the time. Then there's a social convention around not colliding on the keyboard. Oh, somebody exited the script. Okay. Okay, try now. I'm sorry, I, I missed your question. Sorry. You only have one person driving. Mm hmm. One person driving, yes. And so two people are sitting there just like offering commentary and so on. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I've been on a new team for the last month or two, and um, there's one person who has a lot of knowledge in one particular app that I'm very new to, and so I want him on. And then I also want the other developer on because I don't want him working by himself. And so the three of us have been doing a fair bit of pair programming together. And the convention is pretty much, we talk about what needs to happen. And somebody says, here, let me type that. Uh, it's very, very fluid. Um, if you want a bit more of a formal process, um, then you can do sort of a ping pong pairing. And you can do it round robin. Um, there's been some discussion of uh, mob programming where a bunch of people get together in the same conference uh, room and you know two people pair and they project onto a onto a, a screen and then everybody else sits there and watches and then you rotate people through 
So if you search for mob programming or if you uh, search for ping pong pairing, and you'll find some protocols for doing what that. Is mob programming? What's the difference between the, the person who's not driving? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Uh, I haven't actually looked into it, so I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Anybody else know mob programming better than me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so. So, if I can get this down for posterity as well, uh, what it sounds like what you said was when you're doing mob programming, there's the two people pairing, and then the, the rest of the people in the room, room are doing research on questions that come up. Well, cool, thank you. And speak up if the, if the people pairing they stuck. speak up if they're stuck. Cool. Yeah, the only one allowed to actually, like, actually direct across is the navigator. OK. Well, right. There was a question here. Oh, OK. Oh, fun. So that was the Minneapolis Python users group, was it? So they're doing a mob programming uh, thing. That's, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, we uh, have about two or three minutes left. Are there any last questions? Does yeah. Does the preclude individuals in the pairing session from using a custom tmux config or vim config or whatever? Oh. Good question. Uh, so LS pair, so the question was, does LS pair uh, preclude people from using their own custom configurations for either Tmux, Vim, or whatever else? Uh, it does not. Um, by default, it gives you a shared set of key bindings. And I, I did that just for expediency so that uh, when, some, when I have somebody else get set up, I may not know their shell and their aliases, but I at least know <laughs> how to make it work. Um, and there is actually a script in there which will toggle your Vim config in particular. So if you want to switch out your custom Vim config for the LS pair one, you can do that and then switch it back when you're done, which is really nice. Um, I set it up as, as the basis for a shared environment that everybody could be minimally comfortable in. And what you do with it from there is, is up to you. So I think we might have time for one more, if there is one. Okay, thank you very much.